Well, we come this morning to the last installment of the book of James. If you are not there, I invite you to turn there, James chapter 5. I don't know if you have enjoyed this study, but I have immensely. James has been such a blessing to me personally, and of course I've read it over the years, but never studied it at this level, and it's been such a rich and and wonderful time, and I hope you have found that to be true for you uh, as well. Again, we're in James chapter 5. We'll be looking at the last section, verses 13 through 20, and in a moment we'll make our way through these verses. Have you ever been in an awkward situation where you didn't know what to say or what to do. Several years ago, I was asked to do a funeral in Roanoke. I didn't know the young man that died. A friend of a friend sort of recommended me to do it. Now, we all know that talking about death can be uncomfortable. But talking about death of a stranger to a family you don't know is even more uncomfortable. And to go even further, if you will, the circumstances were even more difficult. The young man died from a gang-related drug deal gone bad that ended in a murder-suicide. Now, when I heard that originally, I agreed to do the funeral mostly because I thought, well, the funeral will be a room full of lost people. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for family and friends to hear of Jesus. But I didn't think about everything leading up to the funeral and just how hard some of that would be. Rebecca and I drove over to Roanoke and we met the family and I will, I will never forget sitting in their small living room and there was 12 grieving people and, and four giant elephants, if you know what I mean. I did not know, am I supposed to talk about the fact that drugs were involved in his death? Do I bring up the fact that there were gangs and police? Do, do we mention suicide and the murder? I mean, like, I really did not know what I should have said and what I shouldn't say. And to this day, I praise God for my wife. She had the most maternal relational instinct, and she carried that conversation. She was more pastoral in some ways than I was in that moment in helping this family work through these things. But you know, as I look back at that that event, there was one moment when I felt confident. Just honestly, one moment that I felt comfortable with that family. It was when I turned to the family and I said, if it's okay with you, I would be honored to pray for you. I I didn't know how to talk about drugs. I didn't know how to talk about gangs. I didn't know how to talk about suicide. But I knew how to talk to God. And the Lord taught me a very important lesson sitting in that living room that day. And that lesson, I think, is is part of the lesson in James chapter 5, a lesson about difficult conversations and even uncomfortable moments when we're with others. We've all had situations like this. Some of you, you, someone you know or you love, that they go through something painful or shameful or even sinful. They go through a divorce or maybe someone has breast cancer or someone had an affair or they got fired from their job for misconduct or a daughter, a son was diagnosed with leukemia, any number of things, and you sort of hear and know about this, and then one day you see them at Kroger or the post office, and you think to yourself, what do I say? What do I do? Do I avoid them? Do I approach them? Do I bring it up? Do I not bring it up? What what, what on earth do I do in this awkward situation? Well, if you've ever been there, I think our passage today, James chapter 5, gives us some helpful guidance. James in this text is going to teach us that when those around us are going through painful, shameful, and even sinful moments, there are some things that we can do. As as difficult it may be, even in those awkward or uncomfortable moments, James says that we must commit ourselves to prayer and care. 
that we must commit ourselves, even in the awkward or difficult moments, we must commit ourselves to prayer and care. And I think it's wonderful how he sort of compresses these thoughts into these final words here, because if we think about who it is, what it means to be a church today, we can do all kinds of things. We can have all kinds of events, all kinds of ministries, but it ultimately is for very little profit if it's not undergirded by these two activities, prayer and care. Brothers and sisters, you may not be very good at small talk, You may not know how to counsel another person, but every one of us can be good at praying for people. Every one of us can lean in and care for people. And according to James, these are not just activities we can do. These these are activities and things we must do if we're going to operate as the body of Christ, particularly in those hard and uncomfortable moments that happen. So in this text, James is going to highlight two activities, two activities that we must make sure we do in painful, shameful, and awkward moments. The first activity comes in verses 13 through 18. If you notice there, in these verses, James teaches us, number one, that the church must always pray, especially for the sick. The church must always pray, especially for the sick. Notice how he begins, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Now, notice in those two, in that verse there, James asks two questions and answers them both. And he mentions what you might think of as the extremes of life. On one end of the spectrum, we have suffering. We all go through that. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's, there's moments when we're cheerful. We all go through that. In fact, as I was thinking about this verse, it reminded me of a, a greeting card section at a store. All right, you, you walk into the greeting card section, what, there's a whole section about suffering. Cards for pain and bereavement and loss and sickness. We have those cards. And you turn around, and the other section is all about being cheerful. Birthdays and anniversaries and, and, and all those kinds of good moments in life. Even Hallmark understands that life is full of these extremes. And James is reminding us life is not one-dimensional. Therefore, our prayer life should not be simply one-dimensional. If if you're only asking God for stuff, you're doing something wrong. And if you're only thanking God for stuff, I would say, you're also doing something wrong. James is saying it doesn't matter which end of the spectrum you're on or even in the middle there. If you have a great day, tell God about it. If you're having a lousy day, Tell God about it. In fact, I think the point of verse 13 is this. There is, it is never wrong for us to pray. Never. Whether it's one extreme or the other extreme or somewhere in between, prayer is always the right thing to do. Now, some of you may think, well, I'm not very good at praying. I've tried it. It's hard. You know, my prayers aren't very good. They're not eloquent. They're not impressive. I've heard other people pray. Listen, brothers and sisters, maybe you're overthinking it. Look at what James says in verse 13. It's very simple. He mentions two things, prayer and praise. The next time you sit down to pray, just ask yourself two questions. What can I ask God for and what can I thank God for? And then take inventory of your life. You don't have to have all the formulas and fancy things. Just think of those two areas. And when you're trying to pray for a friend or a loved one going through something, and you say, well, I don't really know how to pray right now, ask yourself those same questions. What can I thank God for right now, and and what can I ask God for? James is saying here that that if, if the church can pray in the good times and in the bad times, then we should commit ourselves to pray at all times. Paul said, pray without ceasing. That's basically the heart of verse 13. So James says the church must always pray, no matter where you are in life. But sometimes that can be hard and and maybe even physically challenging or difficult. What if a person is in the ICU? What if a person is hooked up to dialysis? What if a person can't come and join us for our prayer time like we have. Well, James is going to answer that question. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? 
then he must call for the elders of the church and they're to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. I tell my preaching students that verse by verse preaching is good because it forces you to preach on stuff you might want to skip. Well, here's two verses that part of me feels like I want to skip. These are two very challenging verses that have been both abused by those that uh, would overemphasize them and then those that would even ignore them, I would say. Now, let me say this up front. If I look at these verses here, you, you know one thing this definitely teaches me and teaches all of us? Your body matters to God. I'm telling you, it matters. Do not believe this, this pseudo-spiritual stuff that people say, well, your soul is good and your body is bad, it's like a bird trapped in a cage and you got to get out, blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. I love what C.S. Lewis said, stop trying to be more spiritual than God. He said, God made matter and he likes matter. And guess what? Your body is matter that matters. And he's saying here, when your body is sick, when you are wounded, when you are hurt, we should seek healing. We should seek restoration. It, your, your body does, does matter. Now, admittedly, these verses are very tricky. I, I think given the description here, notice he says, is anyone sick? He must call for the elders of the church. I think the sickness here is not just the common cold. I don't think he's saying every time you get a sniffle or a sneeze... Call the elders. I didn't take a poll, but I'm on behalf of the elders, thank you for not doing that, okay? We, it'd be no end to the number of prayers we would have to pray to, to do that. I, I think the idea here is this person is so sick that they, they actually can't come to a prayer meeting. They can't come to the church. They're not able to even get out of bed, so they have to call for the, the elders to come to them. By the way, it is worth noting here that what is described in these verses is not a public healing service. It's not a Benny Hinn crusade. This, this is not just stretch out your hand to the TV and hope that something kind of happens to you. J James is saying if you're going to seek healing, don't, don't seek it from those self-appointed hucksters who blow into town one week and are gone the next week. If anything, turn to your local church leaders. Turn to your pastors, turn to your elders, turn to those who are given a charge to watch out for your soul. Be sure that you come to them, which by the way is why every one of us needs elders. Why we need shepherds, those that, that can do this for us. So he says to call for the elders, and what do they do? He says they are to, verse 14, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of of the Lord. Now we could spend the whole service talking about the oil, what it is or isn't. In fact, my time's running short. I think I'm going to skip. No, I'm just kidding. I, I. Well, there's one reference. There's one reference to this elsewhere in the Bible. Mark chapter six, in verse thirteen, it says Jesus sent out the disciples, and they were casting out demons, and quote, they were anointing with oil many sick people. So it seems to be what the elders are told to do here in James 5 is patterned after what the disciples did in Mark 6. Now, that still raises the question, then, but what's the oil? What's, what's the purpose of this? Well, some people say it means pray and take your medicine. I think, by the way, that's great advice. I think it's wonderful advice. You should absolutely do that. In fact, if you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, when he saw the man ble bleeding and wounded, he didn't just say, I'll pray for you. What did he do? He literally bandaged his wounds and he poured on oil. So it appears that maybe oil had some medicinal property. Maybe it was used in that sense as a disinfectant. So I think there may be some precedence for that idea. But having said that, I don't think oil is, is given to us here as a, as a cure-all. I know I'm going to offend the essential oils people. Sorry, don't come after me. But <laughs> the, the oil's not a panacea. 
So, so at the same time, oil in the Bible also represented the Holy Spirit. We see that in many cases in Scripture. And we know that when healing comes about, it's done by the power and the presence of God himself in the life of that person. Furthermore, oil was used particularly in the Old Testament as a sign of blessing and dedication. When a priest or a king would be set apart for their role, they would anoint them with oil on their head or, or pour it over them as a, as a symbol of that they're being set apart, dedicated to God for a particular purpose. So is the oil medicine? Does it represent the Holy Spirit? Is it a symbol of blessing? My answer is yes. I don't see why it has to be one of those things, if not, in some sense, all of those things. But, but I would press on to you this. Just notice here. The oil is an interesting thing here, but may I remind you, it's not the main thing here. The main thing here is prayer. James says repeatedly, he doesn't say apply the oil repeatedly, but repeatedly he says pray. Pray over him. That is to pray both for him and with him, to pray in the presence of the sick that they might be healed. By the way, the question may get asked, do our elders do this? Yes, we do. We've done this on several and in, in different occasions. Again, we don't make a spectacle out of it because it doesn't seem to be that's what it is. It's just something that, that does happen in the life of the church. And it's so interesting to me that even though, you know, different people can take this passage differently, every time we do that, I have been reminded that there is something to this. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's something to this. And we have done it on several occasions. Many of you know in our church, Miss Linda Leverett, when she originally got her cancer diagnosis and they were only giving her a very short time, if not months at one point, we gathered and we laid hands on her and the elders pray for her. And here she is now years later, continuing to, to serve God and be in, in, in improving and, and continued health. And so I, I don't exactly know how, exact, how all of this works, but this is something that the church is called to do and the leaders are called to do. And we seek to do that. Notice he continues, though, in 15 and says, The prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Now, what makes verse 15 hard is how definitive it sounds. Right? It's as if James just says, well, do this and do this, and this is what will happen. And as, but as I thought about this, I thought, but you know, if you read your Bible honestly, this is how the Bible often talks about prayer. It, it often talks about prayer with a sense of confidence. Right? Confess your sins, not going, man, I hope I get forgiven. No, it's pray with, with assurance that you'll be, that you'll be forgiven. And so when we pray for the sick, I think we should, in fact, pray with boldness and without doubting God and his ability. In fact, in James chapter 1, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. But what? Don't, don't do it doubting. Because if you come praying saying, maybe he, God can answer my prayer, maybe God can't answer my prayer, he's definitely not going to answer that prayer. So I think the prayer of faith is a commitment and expecting God to work, a confidence in God. I think many of us tend to one of two extremes. On the one hand, some of us, we never expect God to actually heal people. Or we practically require him to do it by demanding. And I think scripture presents a, a more balanced approach of those extremes. We, we know that it's not God's will to heal every sick person because otherwise Christians would never die. And just a few weeks ago, we lost a church member who got sick suddenly. And she and she died. So I think this passage here has to be read in light of the rest of Scripture, and yet it's a reminder that, that God has ordained not just the end, but also the means to the end. And so if the end is healing, this is one of the means by which he has said, this is how I'm going to do it, is through the prayers of the church, particularly those in leadership. I think on the whole, the Bible teaches us that when you get sick, be sure to both talk to your doctor and talk to God. It would be foolish to do one without the other. And, and let's be clear about these verses here. This is maybe the most important part. He is quite clear here. The power to bring about this healing is not in the oil. It's not in the elders. It's not even in the faith. It is in the Lord. 
he says we anoint in the name of the Lord. He does not say in verse 15, the elders will raise him up. He doesn't even say the faith will raise him up. He says the Lord will raise him up. And so he's saying here, listen, whether it comes through a prayer or a patch or a pill, all healing is God's healing. Where there is healing, there is God. And he is at work. Whether it's supernatural in an instant or whether it's through the natural processes and outworkings of this world. James also curiously adds in 15, if, um, if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Notice he says if, he doesn't say since. James is not saying every sickness is the result of sin. We can think of the man born blind in John 9, right? Who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said, neither one of them. That's not how that happens. Sometimes it's just the result of the fall. But let's be honest, sometimes sickness can be the result of sin, whether we realize it or not. In 1 Corinthians 11, we are told there that there were believers, there were those in the church that were sick and some even died because they partook of the Lord's Supper in a flippant and sinful manner. So it is possible, I think, that, that our sins may have this effect. That should be taken into consideration. Listen, your sickbed may be God's altar call. Don't just consider your body, consider also your soul. But I think there's also something deeper happening here in these verses that maybe makes sense of everything that's kind of weird here in verses 14 and 15. If you're taking notes, write down Psalm 103. Because Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who heals all our diseases and pardons all our iniquity. See how they're tied together there? I, I think what James is calling upon is the words of Psalm 103 that Israel looked to God as the ultimate source for healing, both of their body and of their soul. And James is saying that we should do the same. The same God who did that in Psalm 103 is still at work in the lives of his people today. James moves from physical to spiritual things. Verse 16, he says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. So notice it's not simply that the elders pray for the sick. I think it, it includes every single one of us. And he mentions here confessing your sins to one another. It means to agree with God and with others that, that if you have done a sin, if you have done something wrong, that it is wrong, it is an offense to God, and you're seeking to forsake that. By the way, this, this statement here in verse 16, confess your sins to one another, this may be one of the most important and yet underestimated calls of this passage. This right here is the work of God's Spirit in the lives of His people. And I can, I can show it to you. What does the world do after they sin or do something wrong? They cover it up. The worldly way is to hide it. The worldly way is to shove it under the rug, to save face, to maintain appearances. There's nothing wrong to see here. But my friends, the way of Christ is the way of confession. The way of Christ is the way of humility. The way of Christ is the way of transparency. To bring into the light what has been done in the darkness. Because there and only there will we find the forgiveness of our sins. And that is a work of God's Spirit to get us to that point. So brothers and sisters, are there sins in your life, maybe secret sins, things that you have hold on to? The call today is confess it. Confess that sin. And by the way, notice, he does not say here, confess your sins to a priest. Or even to an elder. Look what he says. Confess your sins to one another. That's the church member sitting around you. This is the kind of relationship that we are to engender is that sense of, of, of maintaining those things. Now, if your knee-jerk response to that is, well, I don't want anybody knowing my business, then what you want is called the appearance of godliness and not godliness. 
Godliness calls us to invite people into our business and to say, I have, weak, I have blind spots, I have weaknesses, I have struggles, and I need you to help me see what they are so that we can grow together in the likeness of Christ. Do you have people like that in your life in this church? Those that you could call for prayer, that you could confess your sins to, that you could have ask you those hard questions? He calls us to do that, to confess your sins to one another and to pray for one another. Now, for some of you, this sounds intimidating. The idea of praying for somebody else's sanctification, the idea of praying for somebody to be healed, I mean, that sounds like too much, and James knows that. So he says at the end of verse 16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And then he gives an example. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. I think he's saying here, Elijah was a man like us who was ordinary. He had fears and concerns. If you read 1 Kings, Elijah did some incredible things, some marvelous things, and yet Elijah also had weaknesses. He got hungry. He was frail. He was depressed. At one point, he was even suicidal. So here was a man who had a nature just like ours, and yet he prayed, and God answered that prayer. Why? Because it's not that Elijah was something special, but that prayer is something special. And so even if our nature is like Elijah's, and it certainly is, then we are called upon to pray and trust in God to do what only God can do. So the next time you find out that friend has a cancer diagnosis and you just, should I talk about it? You're standing next to a hospital bed and they're hooked up to machines and it's your grandmother and you've never seen her like this and you don't know what to do. It can be awkward. It can be hard. But James says one thing you can do is pray. And I, I know better than anyone in those moments, and I've been in many of them, God does something that you can't do when you pray for the sick and those suffering. You, you don't have to be an ordained minister to do this. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to know Greek. You just have to know God. And when we know God, we commit ourselves to pray. Do, do you regularly pray for the sick? Do you look at the list on Sunday and leave it in the bulletin or throw it in the trash or do you carry it with you to pray for one another as they're hurting? That's the first activity. We, the church must always pray especially for the sick. Number two, and finally he says the church must always care especially about the wayward. The church must always care especially about the wayward. Two verses, one sentence, verse 19. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back. Now let's just pause there for a moment. Notice how he starts verse 19 with two words, my brethren. This is the 15th and final time in this book that James uses the word brethren. What he's about to say to them about what they should be doing and caring for each other, he is appealing to their, their connection to each other in Christ. That, that's the basis for this kind of care. That's the basis for this kind of, of, of relationship, of, of even confronting each other. The basis of it is the fact that we're brothers and sisters. So can I ask you a question? Are the people sitting around you this morning, are they a crowd or are they family? Because if they're just a crowd, then you're not going to feel any obligation to this and be easily just dismiss it and walk away. But if they're family if we're connected to each other, if we can say, yeah, that, that's my brother, that's my sister, th th that is the family of God, then we have a, a unique obligation to carry this out and to care for each other in this way. These fellow Christians didn't just gather with one another, they actually looked out for each other, and, and they were seeking to help sanctify each other. My friends, church membership is not about having your name on a list, it's about having your place in the family of God. God does not want us to be spiritual orphans living by ourselves, detached from family. That is, that is not healthy for any of us. We need to be brothers and sisters who know who our brothers and sisters are so that we can do this. Notice, he says, if anyone strays from the truth, we should keep one eye out for those who would drift, for those who would detach from us, for those who might wander away from the gospel or wander away from the household of faith. We've all seen it, if not done it. 
a person is faithful to God and they love God and, and then what happens? Time goes by and maybe they get distracted by a, their work or a weekend hobby or uh, some relationship. It's not that they've forsaken Christ, they're just forgetting Christ. They get distracted. And so he says, no, you need to go and, and, and call them back to these things. James basically assumes that in every church there's two groups of people. Those who are straying from the truth and those who are staying in the truth. And those who stay in the truth should keep an eye out for those who might stray from the truth and call them back to it. Notice he says one turns him back. This kind of care, watch this, it's first of all personal. He says someone turns him back. He doesn't say a sermon turns him back, although we hope that happens. He's saying that a person goes and talks to another person. And that relationship is the foundation of this call back. And my friends, you cannot do that if you remain anonymous in this group. People need to know who you are normally so that they can say there is something going on that is abnormally. To to see and to recognize where you might be drifting or might be wandering. But this kind of care is also confrontational. No, he says he turns him back. The idea is that he's going the wrong direction. And you go and challenge them to call them towards the truth. Matthew 18 says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. You start there. You go to them. You open God's word. You pick up the phone and you ring the doorbell. You have that hard conversation and say, brother, sister, I am concerned about what I'm seeing. That is a hard thing to do, but James says it is the right thing to do for us to help one another. And why? Because of verse 20. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, I certainly think this is true evangelistically. right? I think that is the ultimate application of this, that when we call men, women, boys, and girls who are lost to turn from their sins and repent and believe on Jesus Christ who died for their sins and rose from the dead and call them to trust in him, this is how they're saved. This is how their destiny is transformed and changed from hell to heaven, from from death unto life. But notice he gives this statement in verse 20 in the context of the church. He's talking about how we help one another. You say, well, how does that, why, why does that matter? How does this happen? I think underneath this, there's an important doctrinal truth. In our doctrinal statement, we say, quote, all true believers endure to the end. So as a church, we affirm this doctrine that the mark of a true Christian is perseverance. What James is describing here is how that doctrine works out from Sunday to Saturday. It works its way out not by, well, I got saved so now I can just do it all on my own. No, all of us, our compass is off a little bit. And we have brothers and sisters who help keep us on the straight and narrow, who keep us going. And this is how that works its way out in our day-to-day life. Yes, we do it for the outside by, by evangelism, by calling them to life and to Christ and to repentance and to faith. But we also do that for those of us inside the church through this kind of accountability. And that way together we persevere in the faith. By the way, can I just point out to what James describes here? Despite what many people think today, accountability is not a bad thing. In fact, we have seen so closely in our own community in recent weeks just how important accountability is. I am telling you, Accountability is essential in our lives because we all have blind spots. We all have tendencies to stray and to drift. Independence may be great for us as Americans, but it is not good for us as Christians. We are prone to dysfunctional habits and selfish choices and sinful desires. You have blind spots. I have blind spots. We need each other to help see them. And that's the call of this passage, is to submit yourself to mutual accountability. That is what it means to care in the body of Christ. To care is not just to say, well, I feel warm and fuzzy. Sometimes to care is to say, you're wrong. You're sinning. Come back. 
to the truth. This morning we received these 16 new members in our church, and we asked them, do you affirm our church's covenant? There's a statement in our church's covenant, it's a promise that says this, we will exercise an affectionate and watchful care over one another and entreat and admonish one another as occasion may require. In other words, we are saying to each other, I'll do James 5 for you if you'll do James 5 for me. That's what we're saying to each other. And to push this off is to to set yourself up potentially for destruction. James says, no, no, your soul and your sanctification, it is the church's business. It is the way in which we help each other grow and persevere and press on as God's called us to do. We had a a church member many years ago, some of you old timers will remember, Dr. J. Gordon Henry. Some, Some of you remember his name. Dr. Henry is a retired pastor and evangelist. He used to pray this prayer, and every time he prayed it, it just, it struck a chord with me in a good way. He would, he would re- some of you remember, he regularly prayed, Lord, don't give us another church member until we care about the ones we already have. Well, that's a heavy thought. It's not just about getting more people. I praise God for these 16 people, but what good is it if we don't look out for each other? No, the call of this passage is a kind of care that goes beyond Sunday morning from 11 to 12. This is not just a job for the elders, it's a job for all of us to keep on one anothering each each day and each week. To make sure our lives overlap and our elbows rub and that we're helping each other grow. When you sit down with someone and, and raise concerns and issues of holiness and godliness and sanctification, are those awkward conversations? You better believe it. Are those difficult conversations? Yes, they are. But my friends, we have to do it because it's the right thing to do. To care for each other, especially for those that are wayward and should be called back to the truth. For some of you, the the way to do this, the first step, is you need a family. You need a church family. You need brothers and sisters and elders. You need people who will watch out for you, body and soul, and care for you. Sign up for our membership class. If not here, go join another church where you can have that and have your soul cared for. And for those of us that are members, the call is for us to follow through on this. I know COVID has made us all isolated and weird and and all those kinds of things. Listen, we are all going to have to work overtime to make sure we're connected with each other. I don't know when this thing's going to end and when we can go back to life as usual, but COVID is not an excuse to stop caring. And COVID is not an excuse to, to lack accountability. And it's not an excuse to shirk our relationships. We are called at times like this to, to work overtime, if anything, to connect with each other, to know others and to be known by others so that we can grow in the likeness of Christ. Church family, there's a whole lot of things that we can do as a church. We can have events, we can have the ministries, we can have all kinds of things. But so much of it is meaningless if we are not committed to prayer and to care. So that's the challenge this morning. How about you? Are you doing your part in praying for others, especially the sick? Are you doing your part caring for others? Have you invited this kind of accountability into your life with those around you? My friends, The call of the gospel is before us to live lives worthy of that gospel and to make sure that we give ourselves to grow with one another as God has called us to do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, we are reminded that James calls us away from death, away from sin, and calls us towards life. And Lord, we know that that the only rescue from death and sin and hell is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that Christ paid the penalty for our sins, that he, he took the death that we deserve, that he paid the price for sins so that we might have life and life abundant. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who doesn't know Christ, that's where they would begin to return from their sins and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And as brothers and sisters Lord, may we also confess our sins, our drifting, our waywardness, our lack of courage to speak up to each other. 
And Lord, may we as a family grow together as we pray, as we care, that we might honor you. Help us, O oh Lord, in this world that is so confused about what's right and what's holy, that we would stand as salt and light as an emblem of what you've called us to. Thank you, Lord, that you've called us to this through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.